Gunlaug Sauga Ormstonga, the Sauga of Gunlaug the Warm Tongue and the Rotten the Scald. Chapter 1 of Thorstein Eyjarsson and his kin. There was a man called Thorstein, the son of Eyr, the son of Skarlagrim, the son of Kveldulf the Herser of Norway. Asgard was the mother of Thorstein. She was the daughter of Bjorn, Hord. Thorstein dwelt at Berg in Bergfirth. He was rich of fee and a great chief and a wise man, meek and of measure in all wise. He was not of such wondrous growth and strength as his father Eyjel had been, yet was he a right mighty man and much beloved of all folk. Thorstein was goodly to look on, flaxen hair than the best eyed of men, and so say men of lore that many of the kin of the mere men who are come of Eyjel have been the goodliest folk. Yet for all that this kindred have differed much herein, for it is said that some of them have been accounted the most ill-favoured of men. But in that can have been also many men of great prowess in many wise, such as Kiartan, the son of Olaf Peacock, and slaying Bardi, and Skuli, the son of Thorstein. Some have been great bards, too, in that kin as Bjorn, the champion of Hithdal, priest Einar Skulison, Snorri Sturluson, and many others. Now, Thorstein had to wife Jofrid, the daughter of Gunnar, the son of Lifar. This Gunnar was the best skilled in weapons and the lightest of limb on all bond of folk who have been in Iceland. The second was Gunnar of Lithend, but Steinthor of Ere was the third. Jofrid was eighteen winters old when Thorstein wedded her. She was a widow, for Thorod, son of Odd of Tongue, had her with to wife aforetime. Their daughter was Hungert, who was brought up at Thorstein's at Berg. Jofrid was a very stirring woman. She and Thorstein had many children between them, but few of them come into this tale. Skuli was the eldest of their sons, Kolsvein the second, Eyjel the third. Chapter 2 of Thorstein's Dream One summer, it is said, a ship came from over the main into Gufaros. Bergfinn was he, Hight who was the master thereof, a northman, of kin rich in goods, and somewhat stricken in years, and a wise man he was withal. Now good man Thorstein rode to the ship, as it was his wont mostly to rule the market, and this he did. The east men got housed, but Thorstein took the master to himself, for thither he prayed to go. Bergfinn was a few words throughout the winter, but Thorstein treated him well. The east men had great joy of dreams. One day in springtide, Thorstein asked Bergfinn if he would ride with him up to Hockfell, where at that time was the Thingstead of the Bergfirthers. For Thorstein had been told that the walls of his booth had fallen in. The Eastman said he had good will to go, so that day they rode, some three together from home, and the house carls of Thorstein withal, till they came up under Hockfell to a farmstead called Fox Halls. There dwelt a man of small wealth called Atli, who was Thorstein's tenant. Thorstein bade him come out and work with them, and bring with him hoe and spade. This he did, and when they came to the tofts of the booth, they set to work all of them, and did out the walls. The weather was hot with sunshine that day, and Thorstein and the Eastman grew heavy, and when they had moved out the walls, those two sat down with the toffs, and Thorstein slept, and fared ill in his sleep. The Eastman sat beside him, and let him have his dream fully out, and when he awoke he was such wearied, 
Then the Eastman asked him, what had he dreamt about, as he had such an ill time in his sleep. Thorstein said, If I tell you the dream, then shalt thou under-riddle me, as it is verily is. The Eastman said he would risk it. Then Thorstein said, This was my dream, for I was at home at Berg standing outside the men's door, and I looked up at the house roof, and on the ridge I saw a swan, goodly and fair, and I thought it was mine own, and deemed it good beyond all things. Then I saw a great eagle sweep down from the mountains, and fly forward and alight beside the swan, and chuckle over her lovingly, and methought the swan seemed well content, but I noted that the eagle was black-eyed, and thought on him were iron claws. Valiant he seemed to me. After this I thought I saw another fowl come flying from the south quarter, and he too came hither to Berg, and sat down on the house beside the swan, and would fain be fond with her. This also was a mighty eagle. But soon I thought that the eagle first come ruffled up at the coming of the other. Then they fought fiercely and long, and this I saw that they both bled, and such was the end of their play, that each tumbled either way down from the house roof, and both of them lay dead. But the swan sat alone, drooping much, and so sad of semblance. Then I saw a fowl fly from the west. That was a falcon, and he sat beside the swan and made fondly towards her and they flew away both together into one and the same quarter, and there I awoke. But a dream of no mark this is, he says, and will in all likelihood betoken gales, that they shall meet in the air from those quarters whence I deemed the fowl flew. The Eastman spake, I deem it no wise such, said he, Thorstein said, Make of the dream then what seeth likest to thee, and let me hear. Then said the Eastman, These birds are like to be the fetches of men, but thy wife sickens now, and she will give birth to a woman child fair and lovely, and dearly thou will love her. But high-born men shall woo thy daughter, coming from such quarters as the eagles seem to fly from, and shall love her her with overweening love, and shall fight about her, and both lose their lives thereby, and thereafter a third man, from the quarter whence came the falcon, shall woo her, and to that man shall she be wedded. Now I have unraveled thy dream, and I think things will befall, just as I have said. Thorstein answered, in evil and unfriendly wise is the dream interpreted, nor do I deem thee fit for the work of unriddling dreams. The Eastman said, Thou shalt find how it will come to pass. But Thorstein estranged himself from the Eastman thenceforward, and he left that summer, and now he is out of the tale. Chapter 3 Of the Birth and Fostering of Helga the Fair. This summer Thorstein got ready to ride to the thing, and spake to Jofrid his wife before he went from home. So is it, he says, that thou art with child now, but thou child shall be cast forth if thou bear a woman, but nourished if it be a man. Now at this time, when all the land was heathen, it was somewhat the want of such men as had little wealth and would like to have many young children on their hands, to have them cast forth, but an evil deed it was always deemed to be. And now, when Thorstein had said this, Jofred answered, This is a word all unlike thee, such as man as thou art, and surely to a wealthy man like thee it will not seem good that this should be done. Thorstein answered, Thou knowest my mind, and that no good will happen if my will be thwarted. So he rode to the thing, 
But while he was gone, Jofrid gave birth to a woman child, wondrous and fair. The woman would fain show her to the mother. She said there was little need thereof, but had her shepherd Thorvald called to her, and spake to him, Thou shalt take my horse and saddle, and bring this child west to her hold to Thorgood, Egil's daughter, and pray her to nourish it secretly, so that Thorstein may not know thereof. For with such looks of love do I behold this child, that surely I cannot bear to have it cast forth. Here are three marks of silver, have them in reward of thy work, but west their Thorgood will get thee fair and food over the sea. Then Thorvald did her bidding. He rode with the child to her holt and gave it into Thorgood's hands, and she had it nourished at the tenant of hers who dwelt at Fridmes instead up in Vomfirth, but she got fair for Thorvald north in Steingrimsfirth in Shell Creek, and gave him meat outfit for his seafaring. He went thence abroad, and is now out of the story. Now when Thorstein came home from the thing, Jofred told him that the child had been cast forth according to his word, but that the herdsman had fled away and stolen her horse. Thorstein said she had done well, and got himself another herdsman. So six winters passed, and this matter was no wise thought of. Now in those days Thorstein rode to Herdholt, being bidden there as guest of his brother-in-law Olaf Peacock, the son of Horskuld, who was then deemed to be the chief highest of worth among all the men west there. Good cheer was made Thorstein, as was like to be, and one day at the feast it is said that Thorgood sat in the high seat, talking with her brother Thorstein, while Olaf was talking to other men but on the bench right over against them sat three little maidens. Then said Thorgood, How dost thou, brother, like the look of these three little maidens sitting straight before us? Right well, he answers, but one is by far the fairest. She has all the goodliness of Olaf, but the whiteness and countenance of us, the mere men. Thorgood answered, Surely this is true, brother, wherein thou sayest that she has the fairness and countenance of us mere folk, but the goodliness of Olaf Peacock, she has not got, for she is not his daughter. How can that be, says Thorstein, being thy daughter none the less? She answered, to say sooth, kinsman, quoth she, this fair maiden is not my daughter, but yours. And therewith she told him all as it had befallen, and prayed him to forgive her and his own wife that trespass. Thorstein said, I cannot blame you two for having done this. Most things will fall as they are fated, and well have ye covered over my folly. So look I on this maiden that I deem it great luck to have so fair a child. But now, what is her name? Helga she is called, says Thorgood. Helga the fair, says Thorstein. But now shalt thou make her ready to come home with me. She did go, and Thorstein was laid out with gifts, and Helga rode with him to his home, and was brought up there with much honor and great love from father and mother and all her kin. Chapter 4 of Gunlaug Wormtong and his kin now at this time that dwelt at Gil's bank up in Whitewater side Eluki the Black, son of Halkel, the son of Roskel. The mother of Eluki was Thuri Dondal, daughter of Gunlaug Wormtong. Eluki was the next greatest chief in Bergfirth after Thorstein Eil's son. He was a man of broad lands and hardy of mood, and wont to do well to his friends. He had to wife Ingeborg, the daughter of Asbjorn Hordson from Ornafsdal. The mother of Ingeborg was Thordgird, the daughter of Midfirth Skeggi. The children of Elugi and Ingeborg were many, but few of them have to do with this story. Hermund was one of their sons and Gunlaug another. Both were hopeful men and at this time of ripe growth. 
It is told of Gunlaug that he was quick of growth in his early youth, big and strong. His hair was light red and very goodly in fashion. He was dark-eyed, somewhat ugly-nosed, yet of lovesome countenance. Thin of flank he was and broad of shoulder, the best right of men. His whole mind was very masterful. Eager was he from his youth up, and in all wise unsparing and hardy. He was a great scold, but somewhat bitter in his rhyming, and therefore was he called Gunlau Gormtung. Hermund was the best beloved of the two brothers, and the mine of great men. When Gunlaug was fifteen winters old, he prayed his father for goods to fare abroad withal, and said he had will to travel and see the manners of other folk. Master Aluki was slow to take the matter up, and said he was unlike to be deemed good in the outlands, when I can scarcely shape thee to my own liking at home. On a morning, but a very little afterwards, it happened that Eluki came out early and saw that his storehouse was opened, and that some sacks of wares, six of them had been brought out into the road, and therewithal too some pack gear. Now, as he wondered at this, there came up a man leading four horses, and who should it be but his son Gunlaug? Then said he, I it was who brought out the sacks. Elugi asked him why he had done so. He said that they should make his faring good. Elugi said, In no wise shalt they thwart my will, nor fare anywhere sooner than I like. And in again he swung the ware sacks therewith. Then Gunlau rode thence and came in the evening down to Berg, and Goodman Thorstein asked him to bide there, and Gunlau was fain of that proffer. He told Thorstein how things had gone between him and his father, and Thorstein offered to let him bide there as long as he liked, and for some seasons Gunlaug stayed there, and learned lawcraft of Thorstein, and all men accounted well of him. Now Gunlaug and Helga would be always at the chess playing together, and very soon each found favor with the other, as came to be proven well enough afterwards. They were very nigh of the same age. Helga was so fair that men of law say that she was the fairest woman of all of Iceland, then or since. Her hair was so plenteous and long that it could cover her whole body, and it was as fair as a band of gold. Nor was there any so good to choose as Helga the fair in all of Bergfirth, and far and wide elsewhere. Now one day, as men sat in the hall at Berg, Gunlaug spake to Thorstein, One thing in law there is which thou hast not taught me, and that is how to woo me a wife. Thorstein said, This is but a small matter, and therewith taught how to go about it. Then said Gunlaug, Now shalt thou try if I understand all. I shall take thee by the hand and make it, were I wooing their daughter Helga. I see no need of that, says Thorstein. Gunlaug, however, groped then and there after his hand, and seizing it, said, Please grant me this, though. Do as thy will, said Thorstein, but be it known to all who hereby that this shall be as if it had been unspoken, nor shall any guile follow herein. Then Gunlaug named for himself witnesses, and betrothed Helga to him, and asked thereafter it would stand good thus. Thorstein said that it was well, and thus who were present were mightily pleased at all of this. Chapter 5 of Raven and His Kin There was a man called Onund who dwelt in the south of Mosfell. He was the wealthiest of men, and had a priesthood south there about the Ness. He was married, and his wife was called Gieni. She was the daughter of Nup, son of Mold Nup, who settled at Grindwick in the south country. Their sons were Raven and Thorin and Eindridi. They were all hopeful men, but Raven was in all wise the first of them. He was a big man and strong, the sightliest of men and a good scold, and when he was fully grown he fared between sundry lands, and was well accounted wherever he came. 
Thorod the sage, the son of Ivand, then dwelt at Yarli south in Ulfus with Skopti his son, who was then the spokesman at law in Iceland. The mother of Skopti was Reinvik, daughter of Nup, the son of Mold Nup, and Skopti and the sons of Olnund were sisters' sons. Between these kinsmen was such friendship as well as kinship. At this time Thorfinn, the son of Selthorer, dwelt at Red Mel, and he had seven sons, who were all the hopefulest of men, and of them were these, Thorgils, Eyjolf, and Thoril, and then were all the greatest men out there. But these men who have now been named lived all at one and the same time. Next to this befell those tidings, the best that ever have befallen here in Iceland, that the whole land became Christian, and that all folk cast off the old faith. Chapter 6 How Helga was vowed to Gunlaug and of Gunlaug's faring abroad. Gunlaug Worm Tongue was, as aforesaid, whiles at Berg and Thorstein, whiles with his father Elugi at Gil's Bank three winters together, and was by now eighteen winters old, and father and son were now much more of a mind. There was a man called Thorkel the Black. He was a house carl of Eluki, and near akin to him, and had been brought up in his house. To him fell a heritage north, as Oz, in Watadal, and he prayed Gunlaug to go with him there. This he did, and so they rode the two together to Oz. There they got the fee. It was given up to them by those who had the keeping of it, mostly because of Gunlaug's furtherance. But as they rode from the north, they guested at Grim's tongue, at a rich bonders who dwelt there. But in the morning, a herdsman took Gunlaug's horse, and it had sweated much by the time it got back. Then Gunlaug smote the herdsman and stunned him. But the bonder would in no wise bear this, and claimed boot thereof. Gunlaug offered to pay him one mark. The bonder thought it too little. Then Gunlaug sang, Bade I the middling mighty to have a mark of wave's flame, giver of grey sea's glitter. This gift shalt thou make shift with, if the elf son of the waters from out of purse thou lettest, O waster of the worm's bed, awaits thee sorrow later. So the peace was made as Gunlaug bade, and in such wise the two rode south. Now a little while after, Gunlaug oust his father a second time for goods for going abroad. Elugis says, Now shalt thou have thy will, for thou hast wrought thyself into something better than thou wert. So Elugi rode hastily from home and bought for Gunlaug half a ship which lay in Gufaros from Auden Festagram. This Auden was he who would not fit abroad the sons of Oswif the wise, after the slaying of Kjartan Olafsson, as is told in the story of the Laxdalman, which thing, though betid later than this, and when Elugi came home, Gunlaug thanked him well. Thorkel the Black betook himself to seafaring with Gunlaug, and their wares were brought to the ship. But Gunlaug was at Berg while they made her ready, and found more cheer in talk with Helga than in toiling with Chapman. Now one day Thorstein asked Gunlaug if he would ride to his horses with him up to Longwaterdala. Gunlaug said he would. So they ride both together till they come to the mountain dairies of Thorstein, called Thorgilstead. There were stud horses of Thorstein, four of them together, all red of hue. There was one heavy horse, very goodly but little tied. This horse Thorstein offered to give to Gunlaug. He said he was in no need of horses, as he was going away from the country. So they ride to the other stud horses. There was a grey horse with four mares and he was the best of horses in Bergfirth. This one too Thorstein offered to give Gunlaug, but he said, I desire these in no way more than the others, but why dost thou not bid what I will take? And what is that, said Thorstein? Helga the Fair, your daughter, said Gunlaug. That red is not to be settled so hastily, said Thorstein, and wherewithal got on other talk. 
and now they ride homewards down a long, long water. Then said Gunlaug, I must needs know what thou wilt answer me about your daughter. Thorstein answers, I need not thy vain talk. Gunlaug says, This is my whole mind, there are no vain words. Thorstein says, Thou shalt first know thine own will. Art thou not bound to fare abroad? And yet thou makest as if they would marry. Neither art thou even match for Helga with all out are so unsettled, and therefore this cannot be so much as looked at. Gunlaug says, Where thou looked at for a match for thy daughter, if thou wilt not give her the son of Ilugi the Black, or who throughout all of Bergfirth is more of note than me? Thorstein answered, I will not play at men mating, says he, but if thou wert such a man as this, thou would not be turned away. Gunlaug said, To whom wilt thou give thy daughter rather than me? Said Thorstein, Hereabout are many good men to choose from. Thorfinn of Red Melhath has seven sons, and all of them men of good manners. Gunlaug answers, Neither Onund nor Thorfinn are men as good as my father. Now thou callest falls far short of him, or what hast thou said against the strife of Thorgrim the priest, the son of Kjallak and his sons, as Thorsnas thing, where he carried all that was in debate? Thorstein answers, I drive away Steinar, the son of On and Sioni, which was deemed somewhat of a deed. Gunlaug says, Therein thou wilt hope by the father of Eil, and to end all this, it is for few bonders cast away my alliance. Said Thorstein, Carry thy cowing away to the fellows up yonder at the mountains, for down here on the meres it shall avail thee not. Now in the evening they come home, but next morning Gunlaug rode up to Gil's bank and prayed his father to ride with him, a wooing out to Berg. Ilugi answered, Thou art an unsettled man, being bound for faring abroad, but makest now as if thou would busy thyself with wife wooing, and so much do I know that this is not to Thorstein's mind. Gunlaug answers, I shall go abroad all the same, nor shall I be well pleased but if thou further this. So after this Elugi rode with eleven men from home down to Berg, and Thorstein greeted him early. Well, in the morning, Erlugi said to Thorstein, I would speak to thee. Let us go then to the top of the burg and talk together there, said Thorstein, and so they did, and Gunlaug went with them. Then said Elugi, my kinsman Gunlaug tells me that has been talk with thee on his own behalf, praying that he might woo your daughter Helga. But now I would fain know what it is like to come of this matter. His kin is known to thee, and our possessions from my hand shall be spared neither land nor rule over men, if such things might perchance further matters. Thorstein said, Herein alone Gunlaug pleases me not, that I find him an unsettled man, but if he were of a like mind, little would I hang back. Ilugi said, It will cut our friendship across if thou gainsayest me and my son an equal match. Thorstein answers, For thy words and our friendship then Helga shall be vowed, but not betrothed, to Gunlaug, and shall bide for him three winters. But Gunlaug shall go abroad and shape himself to the ways of good men. But I shall be free from all these matters if he does not come back, or if they are not to my liking. Thereat they parted, Eluki rode home, but Gunlaug rode to his ship. But when they had wind, they all sailed for the main, and made the northern part of Norway, and sailed landward along Trondheim and Nidaros, and there they rode in the harbour, and unshipped their goods. Chapter 7 of Gunlaug in the East and the West in those days, Earl Eric, the son of Hakon, and his brother Sven ruled in Norway. Earl Eric abode as then at Lardir, which was left to him by his father, and a mighty lord he was. Skuli, the son of Thorstein, was the earl at the time, and was one of his court, and well esteemed. Now they say that Gunlaug and Arden Festergram, and seven of them together, went up to Lardir to the earl. 
Gunlaug was so clad that he had on a grey kirtle and white long hose. He had a boil on his foot by the instep, and from this oozed blood and matter as he strode on. In this guise he went before the Earl with Auden and the rest of them, and greeted him well. The Earl knew Auden and asked him tidings from Iceland. Auden told him that there was Tord. Then the Earl asked Gunlaug who he was, and Gunlaug told him his name and kin. Then the Earl said, Skuli Thorstein's son, what manner of man is this in Iceland? Lord, says he, give him good welcome, for he is the son of the best man in Iceland, Ilugi the Black of Gilsbank, and my foster brother withal. The Earl asked, What ails thy foot, Icelander? A boil, Lord, said he, and yet thou wentest not halt? Gunlaug answers, Why go halt while both legs are long alike? Then said one of the Earl's men, called Thorir, He swaggereth hugely, this Icelander, it would not be amiss to try him a little. Gunlaug at him and sang, A courtman there is, full evil I wise, a bad man and black, belief let him lack. Then would Thorir seize an axe. The earl spake, let it be, says he, to such things men should pay no heed. But now, Icelander, how old a man art you? Gunnlaug answers, I am eighteen winters old as now, says he. Then says Earl Eric, my spell is that thou shalt not live eighteen winters more. Gunnlaug said somewhat under his breath, Pray not against me, but for thyself rather. The earl asked thereat, What did thou say, Icelander? Gunnlaug answers, What I thought well befitting, that thou should bid no prayers against me, but pray well for yourself instead. What prayers then, says the earl? That thou mightest not meet thy death after the manner of Earl Hakon thy father. The earl turned red as blood, and bade them take the rascal away at haste. But Skuli stepped up to the earl and said, Do this for my words, lord, and give this man peace, so that he may depart fast. The earl answered, At his swiftest let him be off then, if he will have peace and never let him come again within my realm. Then Skuli went out with Gunlaug down to the bridges, where there was an England-bound ship ready to put out. Therein Skuli got for Gunlaug a berth, as well as for Thorkell his kinsman. But Gunlaug gave his ship to Arden's ward, and so much of his goods as he did not take with him. Now sail Gunlaug and his fellows into the English main, and come at autumn tide south to London Bridge, where they hauled ashore their ship. Now at that time King Ethelred, the son of Edgar, ruled over England, and was a good lord. This winter he sat in London, but in those days there was the same tongue in England as in Norway and Denmark, but the tongues changed when William the Bastard won England, for thenceforward French went current there, for he was of French kin. Gunlaug went presently to the king, and greeted him well and worthily. The king asked him from what land he came, and Gunlaug told him all as it was. But said he, I have come to meet thee, Lord, for that I have made a song on thee, and I would have it might please you to hearken to that song. The king said it should be so, and Gunlaug gave forth the song well and proudly, and this is the burden thereof. As God are all folk fearing, the free Lord King of England, Kin and all kings and all folk, to Ethelred the head bow. The king thanked him for the song, and gave him a song reward, a scarlet cloak lined with the costliest of furs, and a gold embroidered down the hem, and by this man, and Gunlaug was with him all winter, as was well accounted for. One day in the morning early Gunlaug met three men in a certain street, and Thororm was the name of their leader. He was big and strong, and right evil to deal with. He said, North man, lend me some money. Gunlaug answered, That will ill counsel to lend one money to unknown men. He said, I will pay it thee back on a named day. Then shall it be risked, says Gunlaug, and lent him the fee withal. 
But some time afterwards Gunlaug met the king and told him of the money lending. The king answered, Now hast thou driven little, for this is the greatest robber and reaver. Deal with him in no wise, but I will give thee money as much as thine was. Gunlaug said, Then do we, your men, do after a sorry sort, if treading sackless folk underfoot, we let such fellows as this deal us uh, our lot. Now say they shall never be. Soon after he met Thorom and claimed a fee of him. He said he was not going to pay it. Then sang Gunlaug, Evil counseled art thou, gold from us withholding, the reddener of the edges, pricking on with tricking, what he what they called me, worm tongue, yet a youngling, nor for naught so I die, now is time to show it. Now I will make an offer good and law, says Gunlock, that either you pay me my money, or else they will go on home with me in three nights space. Then laughed the Viking and said, Before thee none have come to that to call me to home, despite of all the ruin that many a man has made at my hands, while well, I am ready to go. Thereon they parted for that time. Gunlaug told the king what had befallen, and he said, Now indeed have things taken a right hopeless turn, for this man's eyes can dull any weapon. But thou shalt follow my reed. Here is a sword I will give you, with that thou shalt fight, but before the battle show him another different sword. Gunlaug thanked the king well thereof. Now when they were ready for the home, Thorum asked what sort of sword it was that he had. Gunlaug unsheathed it and showed him, but had a loop round the handle of the king's sword, and slipped it over his hand. The berserk looked on the sword and said, I fear not that sword. But now he dealt a blow on Gunlaug with his sword, and cut off from him nigh all his shield. Gunlaug smoked in turn with the king's gift. The berserk stood shieldless before him, thinking he had the same weapon he had shown him. But Gunlaug smote him with his death blow then and there. The king thanked him for his work, and he got much fame thereof, both in England and far and wide elsewhere. In the spring, when ships sailed from land to land, Gunlau prayed King Ethelred for leave to sail somewhere else. The king asked what he was about then. Gunlau said, I would fulfill what I have given my word to do, and sang the stave with all. My ways must I be wending, three kings' walls to see yet, and earls twain as I promised, erewhile to land sharers. Neither will I wend me, back the worm's bed lacking, by warlord's son, the wealth free, for work done gift well given. So be it then, scold, said the king, and withal he gave him a ring that weighed six ounces, but said he, Thou shalt give me thy word to come back next autumn, for I will not let thee go altogether because of thy great prowess. Chapter 8 of Gunlaug in Ireland Thereafter Gunlaug sailed from England with chapmen north to Dublin. In those days King Sigtrig Silkebeard, son of King Olaf Kvaran and Queen Cormlada, ruled over Ireland and he had then borne sway but a little while. Gunlaug went before the king and greeted them well and worthily. The king received him as was meet. Then Gunlaug said, I have made a song to thee, and I would fain have silence thereof. The king answered, No men have before now come forward with songs for me, and surely will I hearken to thine. Then Gunlaug brought the song, whereof this is the burden. Swaru's steed doth Sigtrig feed, and this is therein also. Praise worth I can, well measure in man, and kings one by one. Lo here, Kvaran's son, grudgeth the king, gift of gold ring. I, singer, know his want to bestow. Let the high king say, heard he o'er this day, Song drop measure, dearer a treasure. 
the king thanked him for his song and called his treasurer to him and said, How shall the song be rewarded? What hast thou wilt to give, Lord? says he. How will it be rewarded if I give him two ships for it? said the king. Then said the treasurer, This is too much, Lord. Other kings given reward of songs, good keepsakes, fair swords, or golden rings. So the king gave him his own raiment of new scarlet, a gold embroidered kirtle and a cloak lined with choice furs, and a gold ring which weighed a mark. Gunlaug thanked him well. He dwelt a short time there, and then went thence to the Orkneys. Then was Lord in Orkney, Earl Sigurd, the son of Lordver. He was friendly to Icelanders. Now Gunlau greeted the Earl well and said he had a song to bring him. The Earl said he would listen there too since he was of such great kin in Iceland. Then Gunlau brought the song. It was a short delay and well done. The Earl gave him for lay reward a broad axe, all inlaid with silver, and bade him to stay with him. Gunlaug thanked him both for his gift and his offer, and said he was bound east for Sweden, and thereafter he went on board ship with chapmen who sailed to Norway. In the autumn they came east to King's Cliff, Thorkel his kinsman, being with him all the time. From King's Cliff they got a guide up to West Gotland, and came upon a cheaping stead called Skarir. There ruled an earl called Sigurd, a man stricken in years. Gunnlaug went before him and told him he had made a song on him. The earl gave a willing ear hereto and Gunnlaug brought the song, which was a short delay. The earl thanked him and rewarded the song well and bade him abide there that winter. Earl Sigurd had a great Yule fest in the winter, and on Yule Eve came thither men sent from Earl Eric of Norway, twelve of them together, and brought gifts to Earl Sigurd. The Earl made the good cheer and bade them sit by Gunnlaug through the Yule tide, and there was great mirth at drinks. Now the Gotlanders said that no Earl was greater or of more fame than Earl Sigurd. But the Norwegians thought that Earl Eric was by far the foremost of the two. Hereon would they bandy words till both they took Gunnlaug to umpire in the matter. Then Gunnlaug sang the stave. Tell ye, staves of Spearden, how on sleek side sea horse, oft this earl hath proven over toppling billows, but Eric victory's ash tree oft hath seen in east seas more of high blue billows before the bows are roaring. Both sides were content with his finding, but the Norwegians the best. But after Yuletide those messengers left with gifts of goodly things which Earl Sigurd sent to Earl Eric. Now they told Earl Eric of Gunnlaug's finding. The Earl thought that he had shown upright dealing and friendship to him therein, and let out some words, saying Gunnlaug should have good peace throughout his land, but what the Earl said came after to the ears of Gunnlaug. But now Earl Sigurd gave Gunnlaug a guide east to Tenthland in Sweden, and he had asked. Chapter 9 Of the quarrel between Gunnlaug and Raven before the Swedish king in those days King Olaf the Swede, son of King Eric the Victorious, and Sigrid the High Counseled, daughter of Skogul Solsti, ruled over Sweden. He was a mighty king and renowned and full fain of fame. Gunnlaug came to Uppsala towards the time of the thing of the Swedes in springtide, and when he got to see the king he greeted him. The king took his greetings well and asked who he was. He said he was an Iceland man. Then the king called out, Raven, says he, what man is he in Iceland? Then one stood up from the lower bench, a big man and a stalwart, and stepped up before the king and spake. Lord, says he, he is of good kin, and himself the most stalwart of men. Let him go then and sit beside thee, said the king. Then Gunnlaug said, I have a song to set forth before the king, and I would fain have peace while thou hearkest thereto. 
Go ye first and sit down, says the king, for there is no leisure now to sit listening to songs. So they did as he bade to them. Now Gunlaug and Raven fell a-talking together, and each told of his travels. Raven said that he had gone the summer before from Iceland to Norway, and had come east to Sweden in the fore part of winter. They soon got friendly together. But one day when the thing was over, they were both before the king, Gunlaug and Raven. Then spake Gunlaug, Now, Lord, I would that thou hear this song, that I may do now, said the king. My song too willest forth now, says Raven. Thou mayst do so, said the king. Then Gunlaug said, I will set forth mine first, if the king will have it. No, said Raven, it behoveth me to be first, Lord, for I came myself to you first. Where came our fathers forth, said that my father was the little boat towed behind. Where to but nowhere, says Gunlaug, and in likewise shall it be with us. Raven answered, let us be courteous enough not to make this a matter of bandying of words. Let the king rule here. The king said, let Gunlaug set forth his song first, for he will not be at peace till he has his will. Then Gunlaug set forth the song which he had made to King Olaf, and when it was at an end the king spake, Raven, says he, how is the song done? Right well, he answered, it is a song full of big words and little beauty, a somewhat rugged song, as is Gunlaug's own mood. Well, Raven, let's hear your song, said the king. Raven gave it forth, and when it was done, the king said, How is it this song, Gunlaug? Well it is, Lord, he said, this is a pretty song, as is Raven himself to behold, and delicate of countenance. But why did thou make a short song on the king, Raven? Did thou perchance deem him unworthy of a long one? Raven answered, Let us not talk longer on this, matters will be taken up again, though it be later and thereof they parted. Soon after Raven became a man of King Olaf's and asked him leave to go away. This the king granted him, and when Raven was ready to go, he spoke to Gunlaug and said, Now shall our friendship be ended, for that thou must needs shame me here before great men, but in time to come I shall cast on thee no less shame than thy house will cast on me here. Gunlaug answers, Thy threats grieve me not. Nowhere we are likely to come where I shall be thought less worthy than you. King Olaf gave to Raven good gifts in a parting, and thereafter Raven went away. Chapter 10 How Raven came home to Iceland and asked for Helga to wife. Now this spring Raven came from the east to Throndheim and fitted out his ship and sailed in the summer to Iceland. He brought his ship to Leeravog below the heath, and his friends and kinmen were right fain of him. That winter he was at home with his father, but the summer after he went to all things as this kinsman Skopti the lawman. Then said Raven to him, Thine aid would I have to go a wooing to Thorstein Ail's son to bid his daughter Helga. Skopti answered, but is she not already vowed to Gunlaug Worm Tongue? Said Raven, Is not the appointed time of waiting between them passed by, and far too wanton as he withal, that he should not heed it aught? Let us do as thy would, said Skopti. Thereafter they went with many men to the booth of Thorstein Eil's son, and he greeted them well. Then Skopti spoke, Raven, my kinsman, is minded to woo thy daughter Helga. Thou knowest well his blood, his wealth, and his good manners, his many mighty kinsmen and friends. Thorstein said, She is already the vowed maiden of Gunlaug, and with him shall I hold all words spoken. Skopti said, Are not the three winters worn now that were named between you? Yes, said Thorstein, but the summer is not yet worn, and he may still come out this summer. Then Skopti said, But if he cometh not this summer, what hope may we have of this matter then? Thorstein answered, We are like to come home next summer, and then we may see what wisely may be done, but it will not be spoken here of longer at this time.
Thereon they parted, and men rode home from the old thing, but the stock of raven's wooing of Helga was not hidden. That summer Gunlaug came not out. The next summer at the old thing Skopti and his folk pushed the wooing eagerly, and said the Thorstein was free to all matters with Gunlaug. Thorstein answered, I have few daughters to see to, and fain am I that not should they cause the strife to any man. Now I will see Ilugi the Black, and so he did. And when they met, he said to Ilugi, Dost thou not think I am free to all troth with thy son Gunlaug? Ilugi said, Surely, if thou willest, little can I say herein, as I do not clearly know what Gunlaug is about. Then Thorstein went to Skopti, and a bargain was struck that the wedding should be at Berg about winter nights, if Gunlaug did not come out that summer, but that Thorstein should be free to all troth with Raven if Gunlaug should come and fetch his bride. After this men rode home from the thing, and Gunlaug's coming was long drawn out, but Helga thought evilly of all these readies. Chapter 11 of How Gunlaug Must Needs Abide Away From Iceland Now it is to be told of Gunlaug that he went from Sweden the same summer that Raven went to Iceland, and good gifts he had from King Olaf at parting. King Ethelred welcomed Gunlaug worthily, and that winter he was with the king, and was held in great favour. In those days, Knut the great son of Sven ruled in Denmark and had new taken his father's heritage, and he vowed ever to wage war on England, for that his father had won a great realm there before he died west in the same land. And at that time there was a great army of Danish men west there, whose chief was Hemming, the son of Earl Strut Harald, and brother to Earl Sigvaldi, and he held for King Knut that land that Sven had won. Now in the spring Gunlaug asked the king for leave to go away, but he said, It ill beseems that thou, my man, should go away now when all bodes such mighty war in the land. Gunlaug said, Thou shalt rule, lord, but give me leave next summer to depart if the Danes do not come. The king answered, Then we shall see. Now this summer went by and the next winter, but no Danes came, and after midsummer Gunlau got his leave to depart from the king, and went thence east to Norway and found Earl Eric in Trondheim at Lardia, and the Earl greeted him well, and bade him abide with him. Gunlaug thanked him for his offer, but said that he would first go out to Iceland to look to his promised maiden. The Earl said, Now all ships bound for Iceland have sailed. Then said one of the court, Here lay yesterday Holfred trouble scold, out under Agdenes. The earl answered, They may be well, he sailed hence five nights ago. Then Earl Eric and Gunlaug rode out to Holfred, who greeted him with joy, and forth with a fair wind bore them from land, and they were right merry. This was late in the summer, but now Holfred said to Gunlaug, Hast thou heard of this, how Raven, the son of Onanda's wooing, Helga the fair? Gunlaug said he had heard thereof, but dimly. Holford tells him all he knew of it, and there what too, though it was talk of many men that Raven was in no wise less brave a man than Gunlaug. Then Gunlaug sang this stave. Light the weather wafteth, but if this east wind drifteth, weak long wild upon us, little were I recking, more this word I mind of. Me with raven mated, then gain for me the gold foe of days to make me grey haired. Then Hofred said, Well, fellow, mayst thou fare better in thy strife with a raven than I did in mine. I brought my ship some winters ago into Lorevog, and had to pay a half mark in silver to a house coral of ravens, but I held it back from him. So Raven rode out at us with sixty men, and cut the moorings of the ship, and she was driven upon the shallows, and we were bound for a wreck. Then I had to give serfdom to Raven, and a whole mark I had to pay, and that is the tale of my dealings with him. Then they two talked together alone of Helga the Fair, and Gunlaug praised her much for her goodliness, and Gunlaug sang, He who brand of battle beareth over weary, never love shall let him. Hold the linen folded, for me when we were younger, in many a way were playing on the outward nesses from golden land outstanding. Well sung, said Halfred.
chapter 12 of Gunlaug's landing and how he found Helga wedded to Raven. They made land north by Fox Plain and Ralfhaven half a month before winter and there unshipped their goods. Now there was a man called Thor, a bonder son of the plain there. He fell to wrestling with the chapmen and they mostly got worsted at his hands. Then wrestling was settled between him and Gunlaug. The night before Thor had made vows to Thor for the victory, but the next day when they met they fell to wrestling. Then Gunlaug tripped both feet from under Thor and gave him a great fall, but the foot that Gunlaug stood on was just put out of joint and Gunlaug fell together with Thor. Then said Thor, maybe that other things go no better for thee. What then, said Gunlaug? Thy dealings with Raven, if he wed Helga the Fair at winter's night, I was anigh at the thing when they settled last summer. Gunlaug answered not thereof. Now the foot was swathed and put into joint again, and it swelled mightily. But he and Alfred ride twelve in company till they come to Gill's Bank in Bergfirth, the very Saturday night when folk sat at the wedding at Berg. Ilugi was fain of his son Gunlaug and his fellows, but Gunlaug said he would ride then and there down to Berg. Ilugi said it was not wise to do so, and to all but Gunlaug that seemed good. But Gunlaug was then unfit to walk because of his foot, though he would not let that be seen. Therefore there was no faring to Berg. On the morrow Halford rode to Redder Water in North Waterdal, where Galti, his brother and a brisk man, managed their matters. Chapter 13 of The Winter Wedding at Skaney and how Gunlau gave the king's cloak to Helga. Tells the tale of Raven that he sat at his wedding feast at Berg and it was the talk of most of the men that the bridge was but drooping, for true is saw that saith, long we remember what youth gained us, and even so it was with her now. But this new thing befell at the feast that hungered the daughter of Thorod, and Jofrid was wooed by a man named Sverting, the son of Hafer Bjorn, the son of Mold Noob, and the wedding was to come off that winter after Yule at Skaney, where dwelt Thorkel, a kinsman of Hungard, the son of Torfi Volbrunson, and the mother of Torfi was Thoroda, the sister of Odd of the Tongue. Now Raven went home to Mosfell with Helga his wife. When they had been there a little while, one morning early before they rose up, Helga was awake. But Raven slept, and fared ill in his sleep. And when he woke, Helga asked him what he had dreamed. The Raven sang, In thine arms so dreamed I, hewn was I, gold island. Bride in blood I bled there, bed of thine was reddened. Never more than I, thou, mead bowls poor or speedy, bind my gashes bloody, then leak bow thy like sith. Helga spake, never shall I weep therefore, quoth she, yet he evilly beguiled me, and Gunlaug has surely come out, and therewith she wept much. But a little after Gunlaug was came brooded about, and Helga became so hard with Raven that he could not keep her at home at Mosfell. So back they had brought to Berg, and Raven got small share of her company. Now men get ready for the winter wedding. Thorkill of Skaney bade Eluki the Black and his sons. But when Master Eluki got ready, Gunlaug sat in the hall and stirred not to go. Eluki went up to him and said, Why dost thou not get ready, kinsman? Gunlaug answered, I have no mind to go. Says Eluki, Nay, but certs that shall go, kinsman, says he, and cast thou not grief over thee by yearning for one woman. Make as if thou knowst not of for women thou will never lack. Now Gunlaug did as his father bade him, so they came to the wedding, and Eluki and his sons were set down in the high seat. But Thorstein Eyl's son, and Raven his son-in-law, and the bridegroom's following were set in the other high seat, over against Eluki. The women sat on the dais, and Helga the fair sat next to the bride. Oft she turned her eyes on Gunlaug, thereby proving the saw, eyes will betray if made love man. 
Gunlaug was well arrayed and had on him that goodly raiment that King Sigtrig had given him, and now he was thought far above all other men, because of the many things both strength and goodliness and growth. There was little mirth among folk at this wedding, but on the day when all men were making ready to go, away the women stood up and got ready to go home. Then went Gunlaug to talk to Helga, and long they talked together. But Gunlaug sang, Light heart lived the worm tongue, all day long no longer, in mountain home since Helga had name of wife of raven, not foresaw thy father, hardener white of fight thaw, what my words should come to, the maid to gold was wedded, and again he sang, Worst reward I owe them, father thine, O mine way, and mother that I made thee, so fair beneath thy maid gear, for thou sweet field of sea flame, all joy has slain within me, lo here take it loveliest, ever made of lord and lady. And therewith Gunnar gave Helga the cloak, Ethelred's gift, which was the fairest of things, and she thanked him well for the gift. Then Gunlaug went out, and by that time riding horses had been brought home and saddled, and among them were very many good ones, and they were all tied up in the road. Gunlaug leaps onto a horse and rides a hand gallop along the home field up to a place where Raven happened to stand just before him, and Raven had to draw out of his way. Then Gunlaug said, No need to slink aback, Raven, for I threaten thee not at this time, but thou knowest forsooth that what thou hast earned. Raven answered and sang, God of wound flames glitter, glory of fight goddess, must we fall a fighting for fairest kirtle bearer, death staff many such like, fair as she is are there, in south lands over the sea floods, sooth saith he who knows. Maybe there are many such, but they do not seem to me, said Gunlaug. Therewith Ilugi and Thorstein ran up to them and would not have them fight. Then Gunlaug sang, the fair-hued golden goddess, for gold to ra raven sold they, raven my match as men say, while thy mighty isle king Ethelred in England from eastward way delayed me, wherefore to gold waster waneth tongue speech hunger. Hereafter both rode home, and all was quiet and tidingless that winter through, but Raven had naught of Helga's fellowship after her meeting with Gunlaug. Chapter 14 of the Holmgang and the Old Thing Now in summer men ride very many to the Old Thing, Ilugi the Black and his sons with him Gunlaug and Hermund, Thorstein Egil's son and Kolsvein his son, Onund of Mosfell and his sons, and Sverting Hafenbjorn's son, Skopti had held the spokesmanship at law. One day at the thing as men went thronging to the hill of laws, and when the matters of the law were done there, then Gunlau craved silence and said, Is Raven the son of Onund here? He said he was. Then spake Gunlaug, Thou wilt know that thou hast got to wife my avowed bride, and thus hast thou well thyself made him my foe. Now for this I bid thee to home here at the thing, in the home of the axe water, when three nights are gone by. Raven answers, This is well bidden, as was to be looked for of thee, and for this I am ready, whenever thou well wills it. Now the king of each deemed this a very ill thing, but at the time it was lawful for him who thought himself wronged by another to call him to fight on the holm. So when three knights had gone by, they got ready for the Holmgang, and Klugi the Black followed his son thither with a great following, but Skopti the lawman followed Raven and his father and other kinsmen of his. Now before Gunlaug went up in the home, he sang, Out to Isle of Eelfield, dight am I to high me. Give, O God, thy singer with glaive to end the striving. Here shall I head the cleave of Helga's love devourer. At last my bright sword bringeth sundering of head and body. 
Then Raven answered and sang, Thou singer knowest not surely, Which of us twain shall gain it, With edge for lurg swath eager, Here are the wound scythes bare now, In what so wise we wound us, The tidings from the thing here, And fame of Thane's fair doing, The fair young maiden shall hear it. Hermund held shield for his brother, Gunlaug, but Sverting, half a Bjorn's son, was Raven's shield-bearer. Whoso should be wounded was to ransom himself from the horn with three marks of silver. Now Raven's part it was to deal the first blow as he was the challenged man. He hewed at the upper part of Gunlaug's shield and the sword brake asunder just beneath the hilt with so great might he smote, but the point of the sword flew up from the shield and struck Gunlaug's cheek, whereby he got just grazed, with that their fathers ran in between them and many other men. Now said Gunlaug, I call Raven overcome as he is weaponless, but I say that thou art vanquished since thou art wounded, said Raven. Now Gunlaug was nigh mad and very wrathful and said it was not tried out yet. Elugi, his father, said they should try no more for that time. Gunlaug said, Beyond all things I desire that I might in such wise meet Raven again, that thou, father, was not a knight to part us. And thereafter they parted for that time, and all men went back to their booths. But on the second day after this it was made law in the court that henceforth all home gangs should be forbidden, and this was done by the counsel of all the wisest men there at the thing, and there indeed were all the men most the counsel in the land. And this was the last home gang fought in Iceland, this wherein Gunlaug and Raven fought. But this thing was the third most thronged thing that had been held in Iceland, the first was after Njal's burning, the second after the heath slaughters. Now one morning as the brothers Hermund and Gunlaug went to axe water to wash, on the other side went many women towards the river, and in that company was Helga the fair. Then said Hermund, Dost thou see thy friend Helga there on the side of the river? Surely I see her, says Gunlaug, and with all he sang. Born was she for men's bickering, so bale hath wrought the war stem, and I yearned ever madly to hold the oak tree golden, to me then me destroyer of swan mead's flame, unneedful this looking on the dark eyed, this golden land's beholding. Therewith the cross to the river, and Helga and Gunlaug spake a while together, and as the brothers crossed the river eastward back again, Helga stood and gazed long after Gunlaug. Then Gunlaug looked back and sang, Moon of linen lapped one, leek sea bearing goddess, hawk keen out of heaven, shone all bright upon me, but that eyelid's moonbeam of gold necklace goddess, her hath all undoing, Rot and me made not of. Chapter 15 How Gunlaug and Raven agreed to go east to Norway to try the matter again. Now, after these things were gone by, men rode home from the thing, and Gunlaug dwelt at his home in Gilsbank. On a morning when he awoke, all men had risen up, but he alone still lay abed. He lay in a shut bed behind the seats. Now into the hall came twelve men, all full armed, and who should be out there but Raven, Onan's son. Gunlaug sprang up forthwith and got to his weapons. But Raven spoke, Thou art in risk of no hurt this time, quoth he, but my errand hither is what thou shalt now hear. Thou didst call me to a home gang last summer at the old thing, and thou did not deem matters to be fairly tried therein. Now I will offer you this, that we both fare away from Iceland and go abroad next summer, and go on in home in Norway, for there our kinsmen are not likely to stand in our way. Gunnog answered, Hail to thy words, stoutest of men, this thine offer I take gladly, and here, raven, mayst thou cheer as good as thou mayst desire. 
It is well often, said Raven, that this time we shall first have to ride away. Thereon they parted. Now the kinsmen of both saw misliked them of this, but could in no wise undo it, because of the wrath of Gunlaug and Raven, and after all the must betide that drew towards. Now it is said to be of a raven had fitted out his ship in Laravog. Two men are named that went with him, sisters sons of his father Onant, one height grim, the other Olaf, doughty men both. All the kinsmen of Raven thought it great scathe when he went away, but he said that he had challenged Gunlaug to the home gong because he had had no joy so over Helga, and he said withal that one must fall before the other. So Raven put to sea, when he had wind at all, and brought his ship to Trondheim, and was there that winter, and heard not of Gunlaug that winter through. There he abode him the summer along, and still another winter was he in Trondheim at a place called Lefonger. Gunlaug Wormtongue took ship with Holfred Trouble Scald in the north of the plain. They were very late ready for sea. They sailed into the main when they had a fair wind and made Orkney a little before the winter. Earl Sigurd Lodversen was still lord over the isles, and Gunlaug went to him and abode there that winter, and the earl held him of much account. In the spring, the earl would go on warfare, and Gunlaug made ready to go with him, and that summer they harried wide about the South Isles and Scotland's firths, and many fights, and Gunlaug always showed himself the bravest and doughtiest of fellows, and the hardiest of men wherever they came. Earl Sigurd went back home early in the summer, but Gunlaug took his ship with Chapman sailing for Norway, and he and Earl Sigurd parted in great friendship. Gunlaug fared north to Trondheim to Hlodia to see Earl Eric, and dwelt there through the early winter. The Earl welcomed him gladly and made offer to Gunlaug to stay with him, and Gunlaug agreed there too. The Earl had heard already how all befallen between Gunlaug and Raven, and he told Gunlaug that he laid ban on the fighting within his realm. Gunlaug said the Earl should be free to have his will wherein. So Gunlaug abode there that winter through, ever heavy of mood. Chapter 16 How the Two Foes Met and Fought at Dingness But on a day in spring, Gunlaug was walking abroad and his kinsman Thorkel with them. They walked away from the town till on the meads before them they saw a ring of men, and in that ring were two men with weapons fencing but one was named Raven, the other Gunlaug. While they were stood there beside these Icelanders smote light and they were slow to remember their words. Gunlaug saw the great mocking here under and much cheering was brought into the play and withal he went away silent. So a little while after he said to the Earl that he had no mind to bear any longer the jeers and mocks of his courtiers, but his dealings with the Raven, and therewith he prayed the Earl to give him a guide to Lefonger. But now before the Earl had been told that Raven left Lefonger and gone east to Sweden, therefore he granted Gunlaug leave to go, and gave him two guides for the journey. Now Gunlaug went from Lardia with six men to Lefonga, and on the morning of the very day, whereas Gunlaug came in that evening, Ravin had left Lefonga with four men. Thence Gunlaug went to Veridala, and came always in the evening to where Raven had been that night before. So Gunlaug went on till he came to the uppermost farm in the valley called Sula, wherefrom had Raven fared in the morning. There he stayed not his journey, but kept on his way through the night. Then in the morning at sunrise they saw one another. Raven had got to a place where two waters were, and between them flat meads, and they all called Glipnis meads, but into water stretched a little ness called Dingness. There on the ness Raven and his fellows five together took their stand. With Raven were his kinsmen, Grim and Olaf. Now when they met, Gunlaug said, It is well that we have found one another. Raven said that he not to quarrel with therein, but now says he thou mayst choose as thy will, either that we fight alone together, or that we all fight among us man to man. 
Gunlog said that either way seemed good to him. Then spake Raven's kinsman, Grim and Olaf, said that they would little like to stand by and look on and fight, and in likewise spake Thorkel the Black, the kinsman of Gunlaug. Then said Gunlaug to the Earl's guides, ye shall sit by side and neither side, and be here to tell of our meeting. So they did. So they sat on and fought dauntlessly, all of them. Grim and Olaf went both against Gunlaug alone, and so closed the dealings with him, that Gunlaug slew them both and got no wound. This proves Thord Kolbeinson in a song that he made on Gulong the Worm Tongue. Grim and Olaf, great hearts, in Gondol's din, with thin sword. First did Gunnar fell there, ere at Raven fared he. Bold with blood bedrifted, bane of three the thane was, warlord of the wave horse, wrought for men's folk slaughter. Meanwhile, Raven and Thorkill the Black, Gunlaug's kinsmen, fought at tender until Thorkill fell before Raven and lost his life. And so at last all their fellowship fell. Then they two alone fought together with fierce onsets and mighty strokes, which they dealt each other, falling on furiously without stop or delay. Gunlaug had the sword Ethelred's gift, and that was the best of weapons. At last Gunlaug dealt a mighty blow at Raven and cut his leg from under him. But none the more did Raven fall, but swung round up to a tree stem, whereat he steadied the stump. Then said Gunlaug, Now thou art no more meat for battle, nor will I fight thee any longer a maimed man. Raven answered, So it is, said he, that my lot is now all the worser lot, but it were well with me yet, but I drink somewhat. Gunlaug said, Betray me not if I bring thee water in my helm. I will not betray thee, said Raven. Then went Gunlaug to a brook and fetched water in his helm and brought it to Raven. But Raven stretched forth his left hand to take it, but with his right hand drave his sword into Gunlaug's head, and that was a mighty great wound. Then Gunnlaug said, Evilly hast thou beguiled me, and done traitorously when I trusted thee. Raven answered, Thou sayest sooth, but this brought me to it, that I bedrudge thee to lie in the bosom of Helgeth the fair. Thereat they fought on, reckoning of naught, but the end of it was that Gunnlaug overcame Raven, and there Raven lost his life. But then the Earl's guides came forward and bound the head wound of Gunlaug, and meanwhile he sat and sang. O thou sword storm stirrer, raven stem of battle, famous fared against me, fiercely in the spear din, many a flight of metal was borne on me this morning by the spear wall's builder, ring bearer on Harding Ness. After they buried the dead and got Gunlaug onto his horse thereafter and brought him right down to the Fonga, there he lay three nights and got all the rites of a priest, and soon died thereafter and was buried at the church there. All men thought it great scathe of both of these men, Gunlaug and Raven, amid such deeds as they died. Chapter 17 the news of the fight brought to Iceland. Now this summer, before these tidings were brought out hither to Iceland, Ilugi the Black, being at home at Gilsbank, dreamed a dream. He thought that Gunlau came to him in his sleep, all bloody, and he sang in the dream this staff before him, and Ilugi remembered the song when he woke and sang it before others. New Eye of the Hewing of raven's hilt fin steel fish, burny shearing sword edge, sharp clave leg of raven, of warm wounds drank the eagle, when the war rod slender, cleaver of the corpses, clave the head of Gunlaug. This portent befell south at Mosfell, the selfsame night that Onan dreamed how raven came to him, covered all over with blood, and sang. Red is the sword, but I now am undone by sword over them. Gainst shields beyond the sea flood, the ruin of shields was wielded. Methinks the blood foul, blood stained, in blood o'er men's heads stood there. The wound earned yet wound eager, 
trod over wounded bodies. Now the second summer after this, Ilugi the Black spoke the old thing from the Hill of Laws and said, Wherewith wilt thou make atonement to me for my son, whom Raven thy son beguiled in his troth? Honor, dancers, be it far from me to atone for him. So sorely as their meeting hath wounded me, yet will I not ask atonement of thee for my son. Then shall my wrath come home to some of thy kin, says Elugi, and withal after the thing was Elugi at most times very sad. Tells the tale how this autumn Elugi rode from Gillsbank with thirty men and came to Mosfell early in the morning. Then Onud got into the church with his sons and took sanctuary. But Elugi caught two of his kin, one called Bjorn and the other Thorgrim, and had Bjorn slain, but the feet smitten from Thorgrim. And thereafter Elugi rode home, and there was no writing of this for Onund. Hermund, Elugi's son, had little joy after the death of Gunlaug, his brother, and deemed he was none the more avenged, even though this had been wrought. Now there was a man called Raven, brother's son to Onund and Mosfell. He was a great seafarer, and had a ship that lay up in Rumfirth, and in the spring Hermund Elugson rode from home alone north over Holt Beacon Heath, even to Rumfirth, and out as far as Bordera to the ship of the chapmen. The chapmen were then nearly ready for sea. Raven the shipmaster was on shore, and many men were with him. Hermund rode up to him, and thrust him through with a spear, and rode away forthwith. But all Raven's men were bewildered at seeing Hermund. No atonement came for the slaying, and therewith ended the dealings of Eluki the Black and Onant of Mosfell. Chapter 18 The Death of Helga the Fair As time went on, Thorstein son married his daughter Helga to a man called Thorkel, son of Holkel, who lived west in Romdal. Helga went to his house with him, but loved him little, for she cannot cease to think of Gunlaug, though he be dead. Yet was Thorkel a doughty man and wealthy of goods and a good scold. They had children together, not a few. One of them was called Thorarin, another Thorstein, and yet more they had. But Helga's chief joy was to pluck at the threads of that cloak, Gunlaug's gift, and she would be ever gazing at it. But on a time there came a great sickness to the house of Thorkel and Helga, and many were bedridden for a long time. Helga also fell sick, and yet she could not keep a bed. So one Saturday evening Helga sat in the fire hall and leaned her head upon her husband's knees and had the cloak Gunlaug's gift sent for, and when the cloak came to her she sat up and plucked at it and gazed thereon a while, and then sank back upon her husband's bosom and was dead. Then Thorkel sang this, Dead in mine arms she droopeth, my dear one, gold rings bearer, for God hath changed the life days of this lady of the linen. Weary pain hath pined her, but unto me the seeker, of hoard of fishes highway, abiding here is wearier. Helga was buried in the church there, but Thorkel dwelt yet at Rondala, but a great matter seemed the death of Helga to all, as was to be looked for. And here endeth the story of Gunlaug, Wormstung, and Raven the Skald.